Well, now let's summarize what we've done in a broad scale and return a little bit to the actual model problem and discuss a little more about how this is really applied. And Della Ram is going to explain at the end of our video some of her PhD work. So here we are. So just a quick recap from the earlier video we did. So cardiac arrhythmia, it's a medical condition which has to do with irregular or too fast or too slow heartbeats or heart rhythm. Um, and it's, uh, you can imagine uh, that the data we can acquire for this, which is electrocardiograms, is a time sequence. So um, that looks something like this. So you have voltage as a function of time. Each line you have an EC ECG here and you can, uh, without knowing anything about the uh, ECG or arrhythmia, you can probably tell that this doesn't, the rhythm here doesn't look very healthy. No, no, it sure doesn't. There's all kinds of changes. There's all, also there's low frequency noise here, which mm -hmm. is a real mess to deal with. Yeah. So um, uh, early on, we talked about how we can define this as a, as a machine learning problem. Uh, our inputs would be uh, the, the time series data, which is the, essentially you can think of it as a vector of voltages uh, sampled over time. And then the outputs for the case of arrhythmia detection, we talked about binary classification. Uh, if it's a one, the output, then that person has arrhythmia or that particular ECG has arrhythmia. And if it's a zero, that's a healthy uh, case. Um, so uh, we can move on to the next slide. So just a little bit more concretely, uh, this ECG that we looked at uh, earlier, here's just the cropped version of it. And uh, j just to really like solidify the concepts here, um, really we're talking about numbers and vectors. And uh, if we wanted to train a machine learning or a deep learning model based on using RNNs to detect uh, arrhythmia, would literally just like go here and read up the all these like little voltage values across uh, time and maybe like uh, we'll sample them uniformly probably over time and um, create this vector and we'll probably have this window uh, that would slide to look because we can't it really doesn't make sense to feed in this entire ECG we don't know over what sort of time scale this was acquired so we we'll probably want to chop it up into smaller chunks and then sample it uniformly over time and then that gives us the uh, input vector that we can just easily feed in in through our uh, RNNs. So I have a question when we have this these windows that we chop, right? We, we have this, and then we chop and move, chop, mm -hmm. and analyze, and move, and move, and move, and move. It's going to take lots of chops to go through the data. So there's going to be a relationship between our window and our mini batch size. Yes. Would you like to say a few words about this? So it's always good to, so as you said, at the end of the day, we're, when we're training this, we're, we are going to use uh, back propagation, which requires, you know, uh, uh, optimization on mini batches that, that you've got in your data. So, and then the window uh, is the, essentially the, the width of the number of samples that you have in that, uh, in that time sequence. Uh, so it's a good idea to, to keep um, a batch size that's a multiple of the window to make sure and if we want to keep everything uh, fixed size. Obviously with RNNs, uh, one thing we didn't discuss earlier is with RNNs we can have variable input size and output size as one of the sort of the strengths or the special characteristics of them. But if we're going to stick to a fixed size with a very simplistic network, it's it's a good idea to, um, you know, ha have a window size or a batch size as a multiple of the window so that you know every time you're feeding in that batch size, that entire sequence that you have, which is really a, 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 comp a, a group of chunks of data uh, really gets processed completely as opposed to like having one sample that gets cut off halfway. Yeah, so, so what we could see is that the window size would, would be a, a, a fixed value, probably not too small mm -hmm. depending on the feature that yeah. you want, and then a bunch of windows comprise a block of data and that block of data would be maybe one batch in our mini batch. Yep. So we want to make sure that we do the calculations in a good way Absolutely. so that the block of data and the number of windows fits in mm -hmm. a nice mm -hmm. manner, mm -hmm. not having round offs and things. Yep. 
And the window size we choose, uh, which is a hyperparameter really, has to do uh, with the actual problem we're dealing with. So it's not, there's no really golden value for the window size. It depends on constraints that you have on your computation as well as the actual learning task that you're trying to do. So if it's a heartbeat problem, in this case, you want to pick a window size that uh, actually captures that Im important information. Or whereas like if you want to, if you're dealing on it on an annual scale, you probably don't want to look at millisecond data, obviously. So it depends on the learning task as well, as well as the computational hardware limitations that you have. Okay, so th this is an example, I guess, of what you were just saying, where x of t minus 1 would be the 120th sample, and x of t would be 121, and x of t would be 122, and we would just feed all that in. Just right through the, the little uh, time steps at the bottom, one step at a time, yes. So, so you'd actually start feeding them in as you go, and you'd have a loop. And as it increments through the loop, you're feeding in the next sample through That's the uh, network. That's correct. And now for a real fun part, I present Della Ram, and she's going to talk in the context of what we've been developing, her thesis work. Okay, thank you. Um, so what I do in my PhD research is actually uh, analysis, automated analysis of echocardiography images, which are ultrasound videos of the heart. Uh, particularly what I do is I try to estimate uh, certain clinical measurements from the videos in order to help with the assistant, uh, with, the, um, with the diagnosis uh, in places where you, know, you might not have expert doctors in rural areas and uh, things like that. So uh, to put things in context in terms of what we've discussed, so as I said, uh, uh, what, what I do in terms of inputs and outputs, input images that I deal with are, are video sequences of ultrasound sound and then the outputs are clinical measurements so if you think about it really um, I, I, do, I do something that looks like this so so far in the course we talked about how CNNs can be used for spatial uh, feature extraction when you're dealing with input images and then you can like learn tasks classification of regression tasks from them and then and when we have we're talking about time series uh, we can use RNNs and you know the RNN family of, of architectures in order to do temporal feature uh, extraction and uh, that to get to the output and similar to the arrhythmia uh, problem that we did um, and then there's a version that when you're dealing with video, there's a version that kind of puts the two uh, rows together. So you have an input video going in, you have CNNs that essentially help you with the uh, spatial feature extractions, and then you have RNNs that help aggregate those uh, spatial features uh, in order to come up with like a spatial temporal representation of the input video that you have. And then you'll get to the output. So the, the type of research that I do and other people in my group, in fact, it would be similar to this bottom row. So what I'm trying to say here is that using these sim rather simple tools, although the mathematics might be a little tricky at times, you can actually accomplish really um, complex projects, things such as, things that actually um, help in healthcare and like diagnosis as well as other, uh, other industries and other problems. So um, that, on that note, uh, on that note, I'd like to close what we talked about CNN, RNNs, and then kind of like putting together a deep learning framework that can actually have, uh, you know, real life uh, um, applications.